Hi everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. Here with us today we have Dr. April Blesky Richek. She is a professor of psychology at the University of Wisconsin, Eau Claire. And as a researcher, she focuses on human mating, friendship, cognitive abilities and intellectual giftedness, and science literacy. And today we'll be focusing on particularly human mating and friendship. Dr. Blesky Richek, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a great pleasure. So, okay, um, we talked a little bit before, and I guess that with you, first of all, and before getting into friendship and all of those things, I would like to ask you to please give us a personal account of yours about the first contact you had with evolutionary psychology, because as far as I understood it, you had a contact with the discipline when it was still in a very precocious phase, right? And you right. even worked under great people like David Leake and David Buss, David Lubinsky and people like that. So could you please talk a little bit about that and also uh, about what you deem to be the importance that the development of evolutionary psychology had for psychology in general? Okay. Wow. So maybe to hit the latter point first, right? It's okay. I think it's been a tremendous paradigm shift. Uh, it's just tremendous what we have with evolutionary psychology. Um, and sometimes I'm still surprised when I come across people who have no idea about evolution and why it would be relevant for humans. Uh, but that's just a new battle, right, to, to, to struggle with. But yeah, I think in terms of my my history or my personal development, I think that as the years go on, the weight um, kind of increases in terms of my knowledge of like how awesome my mentors were. Uh, as, a, as a 17 year old, I volunteered at the Minnesota Twin Registry and worked uh, in David Licken's office, uh, helping him file papers. And he was just an amazing, amazing man. Uh, and then so I was already interested in twins. I was always interested in behavior genetics and, and the logic of twin and adoption studies. And um, when I went off to college, I uh, my honors mentor was Ashlam Caspi and his wife Terry Moffat. Uh, and hence I was and I was already interested in romantic attachment and mating type stuff. And I we we looked at assortative mating. Uh, and they were tremendous. They were amazingly generous with their time with me, little little peon undergrad. And they were busy going off to New Zealand and collecting longitudinal data all the time and just tremendous. And then while I was there at Madison, Ashlam Caspi invited David Buss to give a talk. And I was in my was I in my I must have been in my senior year at this time because my junior year I studied abroad in in Madrid, uh, and so um, David gave a talk and it must have been early that year, and he was currently at the University of Michigan, and he came into uh, Madison and gave a talk and he was talking about jealousy and sexual strategies and I was like whoa everything became crystal clear. Uh, and so I went to the reception and asked him questions and ended up applying to go to the University of Michigan. And um, he at the time was being courted to move to the University of Texas at Austin. And so it just so happened that he and I both started at the University of Texas at Austin the next year. He, of course, as a well prayed professor and I as a graduate student. And then uh, and so I really didn't even know what I was going into. All I knew was that I was studying with David Buss. It was my dream. Uh, I remember the first book I got. I think it. I think it was Matt Ridley's *The Red Queen*, and I and I was like, "Whoa, this is what we're doing." Okay, <laughs> and it was great. Um, and so I really think I don't. I didn't even really know what evolutionary psychology was, but I was there at the beginning and hearing about conversations that David was having with Don, Donald Simons and Lita and John. Uh, and, and others, and it was fascinating, right? And, and it's not until after that you can really appreciate how tremendous it actually is to be there in all the action. And of course, I was surrounded by graduate students like Todd Shackelford and Marty Hazelton, and I was on the, I was right after David Schmidt and all these people who had done 
the super amazing stuff, right? And and paved the way for for me to hopefully make, you know, whatever additions I could. So it was pretty cool to have those mentors. Oh, and in graduate school too, I worked with Joe Horn and Lee Willerman, who are also behavioral geneticists. And then with David and, and Joe Horn, I got kind of hooked up with David Lubinsky at Vanderbilt University and worked with David and Camilla. And they were tremendous mentors as well. And David Lubinsky is his depth of knowledge is is absolutely unsurpassable. I mean, he is really tremendous. So I I learned a lot from him. I only had two years there, but I, I think I I gained um, I, I like to think much more than that in my time with him. Well, what an amazing story you have there. Yeah. <laughs> with such great names. And by the way, for people who will, who will be watching this, I will have in the near future, Dr. David Buss on the channel. So just for you to know. Um, okay, so let's start now with uh, friendship. So we have same sex friendship and cross sex or opposite sex friendship, right? Um, first of all, why is it important to study and understand the dynamics of human friendship? in these two different ways and not simply study to study human friendship in general from an evolutionary perspective? Okay, yeah, and that's a good question. You know, I think David and I were both really interested in friendship because it was one of those relationships where you have this mutual voluntary um, cooperation and, and you don't have genetic commonality, not in the sense of being family members or, you know, and you're not reproductive partners. Uh, and so it was one of those nice components. And of course, you know, other people in the lab at the time were interested in things like homicide. And, and I wasn't really going that direction. I was interested in, in cooperative relationships. Um, I was interested in opposite sex friendship initially. And the fact that you said cross sex, opposite sex, cross gender, th that's been kind of an issue from the, from relatively early on in that research, I had reviewers who would say, well, you should call this other gender friendships. And I was like, well, if I call them other gender friendships, my readers aren't going to know what I'm talking about. <laughs> or my participants, for example, they don't call them other gender friends. Uh, but that whole, like, what kind of word you should use that is the politically correct version uh, has frustrated that has frustrated me uh, in in terms of that research. But but when I was when I was early in my graduate school career, I was reading about baboons, and I, I'm sure that that David probably you know piqued my interest about this. But Barbara Smuts has done some great research with baboons, showing that they have these special friendships, and uh, and I was thinking these sound a lot like you know friends with benefits. Um, in what's going on between male and female baboons and um, females would would uh, mate with a with a few different males and the males that they mated with um, sp gave more attention to them and their offspring and uh, and hence this this made me think about and hypothesize the ways in which men's and women's evolved mating strategies might actually manifest in the way they think about uh, opposite sex friends. So that's how that all began. And and then I remember having a conversation about friendship in general and women and rivalry between women. And um, David and I were having a conversation. I was telling him about the up-down, that women give each other the up-down. Have you heard of the up-down? Uh, no, I don't think so. Maybe not, but you have seen it. This is when women look at another woman and they give them the down and up right as they as they quickly uh, okay. scan their scan their face and body and uh, and David had never heard the term that I don't know if I coined it or who coined it but I called it the up down and I and every every female I know is quite familiar with it um, and David was like oh that's fascinating we have to study that and uh, uh, and of course, we then I started really just digging into the friendship literature, uh, what we already had on same-sex friendship and opposite-sex friendship, and they were ba they were so domain general. They were they were not at all informed by evolutionary psychology, obviously at that point. Um, and it was like, well, people figure out who they want to be friends with, and they start a friendship, and then they they maintain the friendship, and then sometimes friendships dissolve. 
And there was this analysis that, you know, people have investments in their friendships and there's commitment and there's equity, um, but there wasn't an understanding of what might drive that commitment or what might drive that um, equity or inequity. Mm -hmm. So hence we tried to evolutionize it a bit. <laughs> okay. So um, would you say that the cues and signals that people attend to on the opposite sex when they are selecting a mate uh, are the ones that are at the basis of same-sex friendship rivalries. So, for example, uh, cues of attractiveness and sexual receptivity in women and, for example, the ability to generate more resources in men. Right, right. So. I think I, I took the I took the hypothesis or proposed that at least in um, heterosexual young women's friendships that one of the one of the underlying roots of their rivalry and feelings of competition is this this is rooted in discrepancies or competition over physical attractiveness um, precisely because heterosexual young women compete to embody what women what men prize. And um, in a variety of studies, right, we've seen that, that men, they don't necessarily prioritize physical attractiveness first, but especially when you give them a limited mating budget or you look at speed dating studies, physical attractiveness takes a lot of priority, whether people admit it or not. It's a first filter, particularly for men. It's not that it's irrelevant for women, but it's certainly more strongly emphasized for men. And so... Um, or men emphasize it more, both whether they're heterosexual or homosexual for that matter. So um, I, I asked, I brought in female friends in a couple of different studies and uh, asked them questions about themselves and about their friendship. And of course they did this under the, the publicly pronounced agreement that they would not be talking about their responses to each other um, after the study. So I was trying to promote some honesty uh, and then they were, of course, separated for the study. And in these studies, we also photographed the women's and measured their bodies. So we had information about their body shape and their body size. Uh, we certainly distinguished between shape and size, right? Uh, and then we asked them their perceptions of rivalry uh, in the friendship, and we asked them their perceptions of their own and their friends' attractiveness relative to other people and relative and their friends' attractiveness relative to themselves. And I think we got some really um, cool findings from these studies, one being that female friends are similar in those attributes that are relevant for mate search. Uh, they're not similar in body size, like how tall they are, but they're similar in their body shape, that is their waist to hip ratio. Um, we documented that twice. And they're also similar in their bra cup size. So women who are small chested are more likely to be hanging out with other small chested women um, and vice versa. Um, that, that relationship isn't as strong as body shape, but certainly there um, and statistically significant. Um, women, uh, female friends are, are similar in their um, rated attractiveness and they're and these are judges who don't know that they're viewing friends so they're still judged as similarly attractive we've documented that in a couple of different ways like you can give people a, a selection of female friends and then have them match them and they are similar enough based on it I, i'm assuming attractiveness we try to channel it into like oh yep i think it really is attractiveness they're they're responding to people can match friends to uh, an above chance degree um, and then we and then we documented that women's perceptions. Okay, well, first let me back up and just say that the typical female um, doesn't perceive herself as the less attractive friend, and this is a, probably a statistical impossibility in the sense that you can have two me two female friends and they both think they're more attractive than the other one. Yeah, yeah. so that's kind of interesting in and of itself. But when you do this on a continuum the more one female friends per the more that fe one female friend perceives herself as as the less attractive friend the more mating rivalry she perceives in the friendship and the mating rivalry items we used did not have anything to do with attractiveness they were items like uh, i feel like my friend um, steals attention from men um, i worry that my female friend um, um, will 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 
we'll get the same person that I'm interested in, that kind of thing. Um, or I just, or, or just a blanket item. I feel like I'm in competition with my friend. And what we tried to show was that this was unique to attractiveness because women's perceptions that their friend was a better athlete than them, that their, fr that their friend was more intelligent than them, um, those variables were not associated with their perceptions of mating rivalry in the friendship. It was uniquely related to their perception of their friend as more attractive than they. Um, I think that association could be quite a bit stronger, but we have that qualifier, we have that restriction in the sense that the typical female, uh, when you when you pit her against her friend, uh, even if she thinks her friend is more attractive than other women, she's typically not going to say that the friend is more attractive than she is. So there's a bit of a self-protective maintenance going on there, um, is my guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting that uh, your studies gave those results about how women tend to match up in terms of friendship with mm -hmm. other women of equal or equivalent uh, mm -hmm. attractiveness, because <laughs> it's interesting that I already talked with some women uh, who have the intuition that women would tend to match in terms of friendship with uh, uglier women because <laughs> when they went out, uh, for example, when they went to the disco or something like that, uh, and they were trying to get a mate, that the fact they would have an uglier female next to her would work as a sort of contrast. Right, right. <laughs> to, to, to enhance their, their yeah. beauty. Yeah, you certainly don't want somebody way more attracted than you, right? Because they're going to they're, they're gonna draw all the attention away. Uh, and, of course, you also have to worry about their, what sexual strategy they are advertising, however ambiguously it might be. Uh, but then you also don't want a female who's much less attractive either because males will just go off in an entirely different direction, if, especially if that's a powerful first filter. And I, this is a this is an intriguing question. Like Dan Ariely in one of his TED Talks and, 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 and in Predictably Irrational, he talks about this as well, that, you know, you want a slightly uglier version of yourself with you when you go out. And that's a great way of saying it. I, I do wonder if the situation is slightly different for men, however, because, um, you know, men having a slightly uglier version of themselves as opposed to women having a slightly uglier version of themselves. Um, and to the extent that women don't emphasize attractiveness to the same degree that men do, that whole setup could be a little bit different, right? The the consequences and implications for men and for women. And I, I haven't seen anybody study that comparison directly, um, but it certainly would be interesting, right? In other words, men might be, I, 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 I don't know, I guess I won't, I won't speculate too much, but I do think they're, they're slightly different um, situations. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. And uh, okay, now in the case of opposite sex friendships, do they often fail because men and women end up having different interests when they approach the opposite sex to begin a friendship? You know, it's interesting because it's hard to track in the long term um, the percent of friendships that actually fail for those reasons. Um, I, I would say that when we ask men and women about friendships they're currently involved in and friendships that have that they have that have dissolved, um, when you ask them about the friendships that have dissolved, approximately a third will will mention something like, "Well, you know, I, I wanted to date them and they didn't want to date me," or the reverse. Um, there was sexual tension. Yeah, you know, these are at least in my studies, the vast majority have been young adults, and so physical, you know. Physical relocations are responsible for a lot of modified friendships that, that just kind of go downhill. Um, but sexual tension and, and um, um, what would we say, non-mutual attraction uh, accounts for quite a few. At the same time, when you ask them about ongoing friendships, friendships they currently have, uh, they are just as likely to mention attraction as being a relevant aspect of that friendship as they are to mention it being an aspect of their dissolved friendships. So 
it could just be happening in ongoing friendships and dissolved friendships, and then you just kind of you know key into that as a likely cause of the of the disintegration of the friendship. And I just I don't I don't feel like I have the longitudinal data to really make the case that it's lack of attraction or um, attempted involvement and then failure. I, I just don't have the longitudinal data to make the case. Uh, but I certainly would say that attraction, mutual or non-mutual, is quite common between opposite sex friends. Uh, even our middle-aged adult samples will will mention it. And I think that's one of the most striking sex differences that I've documented, that men are more likely than women to mention it as a, as a benefit of the friendship, and women are more likely than men to nominate that attraction as a cost and, and potential frustration of the friendship. Mm -hmm. Uh, and when the sexes initiate friendships with a particular person of the opposite sex, usually the motivation, the underlying motivation they have to do so uh, falls under a certain predictable category. That is, for both men and women, uh, they could start a friendship with someone of the opposite sex with the prospect of that turning into a, lo a long-term romantic relationship, right? Well, you know, I don't, I don't know if that's their long-term, I don't know if that's their long-term goal or intent or not. Um, you know, I, I've had some interesting conversations with, with women in particular where they'll say, well, well, my guys are all, they're all just friends. And I'll say, well, have you, have you asked them if they're attracted to you? And then they say, and then they kind of look off and think, well, I, I guess I don't know. So they, you know, they haven't even, some of them haven't even thought about it. And, and to some degree, you know, we know from, from a variety of domains of research that men and women can pursue their sexual strategies perhaps more effectively by not being aware of their own intentions. So, you know, maybe there is some underlying motivation, or I guess I would just say that there, there are evolved mating strategies operating in the background, um, whether they're aware of it or not. And so the idea is that when you think about, um, when you interact with somebody who is of reproductive age, not a genetic relative, and is, elicit, and is displaying cues of being a reproductively viable or attractive partner that, you know, logically your mating strategies should be activated. Like that is a potential mating partner. Uh, and your life situation may not call for that at the moment, but that doesn't mean that your, your mating strategies and your mating mechanisms may not be operating in the background and coloring um, your interpretation of that person's behaviors and um, facial expressions and so on. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, yes, that makes sense. And then there are also particular differences why men and women start or initiate friendships with someone right. of the opposite sex, right? So, for example, men, much more men than women are interested in having a relationship, a friendship with a woman. Right. Uh, to, uh, to try to have a short, a short term sexual relationship. Right. Or, or even a one night stand, right? And then on, in the case of women, uh, they can start a friendship with a man to try to have another male to protect them. Right, right. Yeah, and I think that's that's an indication, right, that you have these these historical challenges, right, and our and our brain should have evolved to engage in various behaviors that would facilitate um, success under different conditions. And and uh, yeah, I mean, we see this striking sex difference in um, short term. Um, short-term willingness to engage in opportunistic sex and um, short-term mating strategies in general. And so if it is the case that when you mention just the opposite sex, men more so than women, what comes to their mind should be something of a sexual opportunity because sexual just even thinking about that would facilitate um, fruition of a short-term mating strategy. And in fact, in one of our more recent studies, we, we did just that. We asked men and women to think about um, an opposite sex friend. And they, they, we asked them to like type out their initials or type their name. 
And then as soon as they did that, the next slide came up and it said, what characterizes this person? Um, are they a friend of the opposite sex? Are they, um, are they a friend of a uh, person of the opposite sex who I'm attracted to? And then they could check both, right? So they were presented as boxes that you could check both. And men were more likely than women to select the, there's somebody I'm attracted to. <laughs> um, whereas, whereas the vast majority of, of women's responses were a friend of the opposite sex. So just this whole element of how they define it or, or what's your mental imagery when a word comes to mind may be different for men than for women. And it wouldn't, in my mind, be surprising if men and women have different sexual strategies um, constantly going in the background. Okay, and um, are the main reasons for dissolution of friendships the fact that men and women in the case of cross-sex friendships don't get to fulfill these expectations even if they are completely subconscious yeah so even even in i guess what you're what you're pointing to is the possibility that we get these sex differences from men and women when we're asking them to consciously report like explicitly tell us you know, if this happened, would you end the friendship? If this happened, would you friend the, end the friendship? Or why did the friendship end? Um, and even when you ask people to explicitly report, you know, if your friend, um, if if your friend really wasn't attracted to you, how likely is it that you would end the friendship? Uh, men are more, yeah, men give higher rate. They don't give super high ratings, but they give higher ratings than women do to saying, yes, they would end a friendship if there was no no opportunity for sexual interaction or, or the friend really wasn't attracted to them. Uh, and in fact, we find that men's reports of how attracted they think their friend is to them is co are correlated with their reports of having been um, engaged sexually with that friend, whereas their reports of how attracted they are to the friend are not. And so it's almost like if they have that opportunity or perceive that opportunity, they, they are more likely to uh, take advantage of it. So uh, I would say that I shoot, there was something else I was going to tell you about with in the context of what you asked. And now I now it flew away. Um, uh, okay, perhaps we'll keep going. And yeah, if it yeah. comes back to your, to your mind, you just say it. Okay. So, okay, so um, do you think that the study of friendship dynamics in humans helps to clarify uh, mating preferences for each sex? Um, I thought I was, I thought of what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let, let let me tell you what I what I wanted to tell you, and then um, yeah, sure. we'll go back. Uh, it is that when you ask men and women if they have other, uh, it, to some degree, if you have men and women feeling um, discrepant levels of attraction, and, and a lot of people will say, "Well, are you suggesting that men and women really need to talk about how they feel? Uh, it, would that be good?" They, they're looking for the applications, right, of these findings, and and. Um, and I, I'm kind of one of those people who I'm all about honest communication and I'm relatively direct. And so I've always thought that it, it seems would seem like a good idea. Uh, and when you ask, so I asked men and women, have you have you and your um, friend talked about um, attraction in your friendship? Um, and then we have also asked them, like, did did has your partner tried to. Um, act on attraction toward you, and when we ask men and women these questions, um, and they and they say yes, then then we'll ask them, well, who started it? And women will say, he did. The majority of women will say he he did. He's the one who said something. He's the one who acted on it. And the men, um, about half of them will say, some of them will say I did, um, but a good portion of them will say we both did. Uh, so their perception of how the interactions have gone down, because we ask these questions for pairs of friends. Um, so they're talking about the same friendship now. Um, the male and the female don't quite agree on how things have gone down, right, in their friendship, which is also interesting, right, because you're, you're trying to talk about, like, having communication, uh, communication, communicating your intent, and yet there is disagreement about how that communication of intent has, has actually um manifested how it's actually happened in the relationship. So I think that's kind of a fun little, little blip on the radar. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, exactly. And, and then about the question of um, if uh, the studying of uh, the, uh, the dynamics of human friendship would help clarify uh, mating preferences. Or... Yeah, yeah. You know, I think so. In other words, how do we, how, does does friendship help us understand mate preferences? Well, to the extent that we see um, people look for the same types of characteristics in friends, not the same, not the exactly the identical, uh, but uh, certainly many of the same, particularly in opposite sex friendships as they do when they're looking for a mate. Uh, it's kind of interesting, right? Your, your, your physical attractiveness is taking a priority, particularly for men, um, young adult males, when we give them a, a limited budget and we say you can allot, uh, you know, zero to ten dollars to um, these ten characteristics. If you give ten dollars, you're putting, you know, something else is going to have to give because there's only fifty dollars and ten characteristics. Um, their second highest will go to physical attractiveness, um, beat out only by faithfulness. And I think this falls along similar lines. Norm Lee has documented a similar kind of pattern, I believe, with with um, limited uh, mating budgets. And of course, I mentioned speed dating. I think tends to those studies tend to pan out the same. Uh, and so, it, the, my students and I talk about this a lot. Doing a speed friending study, um, speed friending in terms of same sex friends would be interesting, but speed friending in terms of opposite sex friends would be fascinating because if the pattern of data was redundant with what you see in mating, you know, speed dating studies, uh, that would be yet one more, you know, one more piece of evidence suggesting that, yes, men's and women's mating strategies and their mate preferences seem to be operating in the context of their, of their friendship selection. I, I would speculate that they would be nearly identical. Mm -hmm. Yes, and because we're already touching a little bit on mate preferences and mate selection and things like that, uh, I would like you to clarify some uh, very specific thing that is the question about uh, how men pay attention to the waist to whip ratio of women yeah. when, when classifying them in terms of attractiveness. Because there are many people that when you talk ab about this with them, immediately say that, oh, but that must be untrue because throughout history and in different historical periods, men preferred fatter women and then in others, thinner women, right? So, but, but, but the waist to whip ratio has nothing to do with the size of the body. That is the body mass index, right? And you, right, can, have, right. And you can have the same waist to whip ratio with different body sizes. Sure, sure. I mean, body mass index and waist hip ratio are correlated, but they're certainly not the same thing. And and um, if you're if you're interested in body shape, you definitely go after waist hip ratio or just waist size, just waist circumference by itself. We know is a good indicator. And and I would I would mention there are a few people who are really well versed in this literature um, to go to, like Steve Gollin or Aaron Lukaszewski. Um, and they they have given this a tremendous amount of thought, and it's not to say that there aren't historical you know changes in in body size and and what being plump might reveal about your social status or access to resources. Um, but I would argue even within those times, if we had had the data, a plump twenty year old. Uh, their body shape would look quite a bit different from a plump 50 year old and they may have similar body mass index But their body shape would be different. One would be reproductively viable uh, and, and I'm surrounded by this I, I, I mean as a as a college instructor I'm surrounded by women who are between 18 and 22 and they carry a lot more weight than I do but their body shape makes it very clear that they are young and desirable Right. And, I, and I'm on the outs. <laughs> and that's OK. <laughs> I had my day. But, but the point is, right, body mass index is very different from waist hip ratio. And Dev Singh in some of his research uh, looking at and granted, this is American centric, uh, but looking at uh, centerfolds over the course of two and three decades show that that as as the emphasis on thinness and just being, you know, low BMI, as that emphasis increased, the centerfolds, they got lighter in weight, but their their body shape, 
there is clear consensus. 0.7 is still what you're seeing in those in those most desirable or women who are essentially being used as the as the centerfolds because they are desirable. Uh, the 0.7 is pretty constant. Yeah. So um, I don't know. Did you want me to say more about that or? Uh, no, I, th I think it's good enough because uh, I would also like to ask you to please talk a little bit about uh, perhaps the most robust findings uh, that we have in terms of the sex differences in, uh, in the cues and signals that men and women pay attention to when selecting a mate of yeah, the opposite yeah, sex. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think I've you know, it's kind of interesting when you say men and women, because women are attending to so many things, right? Um, and I think a lot of the attention, at least in terms of the physical, uh, suggests that men are paying paying attention to cues of youth and vitality and, and reproductive viability. And um, what exactly are those? You know, you've got the clear skin and you've got the energetic gait and all those types of things. But what what do people observe just from one snapshot or one viewpoint of a of a woman? And um, I think there are a couple of a couple of research lines that I've been involved in that I think help help get at that. And and one is like how important is the face as a snapshot as opposed to the body. And we know that there are a lot of cues in the face because if you look at face as a predictor of full body attractiveness and then body ratings as a predictor of full body, meaning face and body attractiveness, um, the face often carries quite a bit of weight. On the other hand, in, in, the, in a study where I put women in swimsuits uh, so their bodies are pretty exposed, uh, then the body competes with the face as a as a close second in terms of variance accounted for in that full body attractiveness. But you know, Dev Singh would say waist hip ratio that was the magic that was the magic bullet. But in fact, face alone is a very good predictor of full body attractiveness, and that suggests that there is a lot in the face. And so I would argue that symmetry is probably pretty huge. Um, uh, but and, but and, symmetry is huge for both sexes. Right? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, for both sexes. Um, and easily observed in the face, uh, probably more easily observed in the face, perhaps, than other aspects of the body, um, just because you have these close, close-knit features. Um, and both with both men and women, you can look at distance between, you know, the, the chin and the jawbone or, you know, the brow, you know, all that, uh, the angle of the brow the forehead, so many different elements to look at, the height of the cheekbones, um, how big the eyes are, uh, and certainly I'm not one of those who's who's arguing that, that men are interested in infant-like features. There's a difference between infant features and um, reproductively viable features. Um, even capturing, you know, blood flow to the to the face that you see, you see um, not pallid features, but um, skin tone that suggests health right yeah, yeah uh, but, but there, there's that thing about uh, men preferring women with neotenous facial traits right yeah but i don't know if you if you they need to be called neotenous but rather maybe youthful features so okay. and and i haven't seen this study but i would argue that if you had a female who had baby features versus a female who had 18 year old features you know if you can somehow morph those that male's preferences i i think about um um, who is it, Ben Jones uh, and Lisa De Bruin, you know, if they if they ran some face studies and they were morphing the, the features to be very infant-like, uh, that, that neoteny as opposed to more uh, reproductive age for females, but what people find attractive, I'm guessing that people would prefer the reproductive age. Um, so I think that's, to me, it's somewhat of a misnomer to say neotenous because it's infants are not reproductively viable and my guess is that male attention would not be uh, focused in that direction I do know that you know the I there's an interesting line of research and, I, and I'm working with Steve Gollin and Aaron Lukaszewski to try to pinpoint these these bodily features that are essentially redundant with ratings of attractiveness and perceptions of being nulliparous essentially not yet having offspring but being essentially reproductively ready and um, 
And so we are currently um, taking body measurements and photographs of women at, at various angles and women of varying ages. And the reason I wanted to get a hold of natural women is because so many so many of the studies out there today are that track like what men pay attention to are studies that use digitally manipulated photos. So they'll show men pictures of women with with breast sizes of you know manipulated breast sizes and and then they'll or manipulated waist circumference and then they'll track how much attention men pay to different regions of the body. Fascinating research. But in the ecological, ecologically real environment, women with larger breasts do not generally have perky breasts, uh, not until modern day and, and plastic surgery. But over our, our ecological history, um, breast size uh, and um, BMI, um, waist size, those were correlated in ways that uh, I think aren't necessarily accurately represented when we engage in digital manipulations of one body attribute at a time. Uh, and so I was, we are, we are essentially photographing and measuring women who are in various stages of their reproductive career, right? Some of them are 60 and have had multiple kids and um, their body measurements and their measures of attractiveness, body measurements meaning waist hip ratio, waist, waist to stature ratio, waist circumference in general, those should be essentially redundant with perceptions of how many offspring they have had and also their attractiveness or what I say lower rated attractiveness. Um, that's what we're looking to hone in on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something that just came to my mind was that would you say that perhaps those studies that people make with digitally manipulated images of women could perhaps track in terms of results with studies? And I haven't yet got into this literature, literature specifically, but with studies people do about uh, how men would be attracted to um, porn stars because they have exaggerated features right. that, that men like. Right. Um, that's certainly in line with it. I, I haven't seen that either, but I I think the results of the experimental studies coincide with that, that, you know, the eye tracking, um, I want to say this is Varen Swami, Swami's research that I'm thinking of right now, um, that, that when you do the eye tracking, men's attention is focused on the breast area and then the torso and genital area. But when you look at perceptions of attractiveness, um, they're not, the eye tracking isn't completely redundant with what is rated as most attractive. So it's, it is kind of interesting to think about, well, you have this where you put your, your attention to, um, but are the specific manipulations really the, the also rated as attractive and and part of that disjunction i think could be you know the, the low waist hip ratio a lot of attention there and low waist hip ratios rated as, as attractive there's a lot of attention to the breast area but differences in breast size aren't as correlated with ratings of attractiveness well maybe it could be right that there's some degree of disjunction there between large breast size and and actual waist hip ratio certainly yeah, porn stars are are the exaggerated versions, and and that that takes us into a whole other line of research, right? When when people watch pornography, um, women and or men alike, are they are they setting themselves up right for danger zone because you have this perception that that's actually what's what is in your neighborhood, mm -hmm. um, and I and I I don't know if that's the case. It would be it would be I know it's. It would be so unethical, but it would be so ideal if we could randomly assign people to have different levels of exposure to various forms of pornography and then um, look at, I'm thinking young men here, for example, I, I guess I have a teenage son and I always, you know, this is a conversation in my home, does exposure to these um, highly exaggerated and very sexually available um, females um, mess with your interpretation of, of the way normal females should normal females should be uh, and 
maybe, maybe not, you know, like we would, we'd, it'd be great to have some experimental um, data to inform us about that. Of course, we know that from Doug Kenrick's research in Gutierrez that exposure to highly attractive women um, is followed by lower levels of commitment to one's own partner. Uh, so that's probably uh, uh, an indication of, of what the effects of exposure to pornography um, on a repeated basis could be. But on the other hand, it's, it's an outlet. So. Yeah, and in the case of pornography, and particularly for men, because, I, I mean, men are much more interested in the physical side of sex than women, right? And yeah. how and how women uh, predispose themselves to a variety of sexual activities. Let's say we, uh, men are more interested in, <laughs> in variety right. than women usually are. Uh, it's uh, so there's also that component to it because it's not just that uh, porn stars have ex exaggerated features, but also that they expose themselves to a lot more variety of sexual performances than normal right. normal women would expose them to. Right. Right. That's a that's a great um, a, an excellent point. Yeah, you know, and it's 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 so interesting too because you you also mentioned right that men are are they're they're more they're more in tune with the sexual experience, the aesthetic appeal, right, of just that seeing the body parts, and and not to say that women aren't sexually aroused by that exposure as well, but that that for them it is it is largely aesthetic, and I, and. I think to some degree, this is where evolutionary psychology can be such an important thing for humans to have in their, you know, in their toolkit, like some awareness of, of men's and women's um, sexual strategies and the fact they do actually differ. And I, I, when I teach evolutionary psychology or behavioral genetics for that matter, I, I say countless times to my students, you know, knowledge is power. I can't, I can't, I can't fathom how ignorance could be bliss right? Understanding how genetic dispositions operate in the context of different environments is so important. Understanding the basic idea of, you know, you have callus producing mechanisms. If you don't activate those callus producing mechanisms, you won't ever have calluses, but that doesn't mean you don't have callus producing mechanisms. You have mechanisms that drive jealousy and what you may respond to could be entirely different from your what your male or female partner is responding to. And when people, I think, have some acceptance of the fact that males and females do have very similar strategies and preferences in some ways, but also dramatically different preferences and strategies, they can start trying to put themselves in their partner's brain just a little bit. And I'm not saying like, oh, well, my, you know, this men are so interested in sexual novelty, I should, you know, my husband, he should watch porn all the time. No, it's rather a, oh, so you you actually respond to novelty how how could we how could we use that in our own relationship right to keep things spicy um as opposed to the the a typical female not really caring about novelty or sexual variety or um it just leads to a different dynamic for communication between the partners or or the the idea that anytime uh, i know a variety of women who feel that if their partner even looks at other women that this is sexual infidelity that this this is infidelity for them and i have a hard time I have a hard time accepting that position when i recognize that for males and i and i have never sat in a male mind i i, I can't i can't be that and and my husband says i would never want more than five minutes in a male brain that's what he tells me <laughs> uh, yeah i know but um and i so i've never been there but my impression uh, of the re from the research is that for the male brain, a female is an is an aesthetic object, and so you you don't walk by an attractive female and not notice the attractive features of that female, and it doesn't mean that you want to cheat on your partner. It doesn't mean that you're going to fall out of love with your partner, but rather that you are just responding to people out there in the world in a way that the female brain is less likely to, and I'm not saying females don't, but they are less likely to respond um, to to males out and about in that same way. Um. 
Yes, and now that we're talking about this, I would like to go one step further before moving to the next question, because this is really a topic that interests me. Uh, we already talked about porn stars and the exposition of men to pornography. What are your ideas about uh, sexual robots? Because, I mean, there, there, there are many sides to the question. There are, for example, people who say that it would be completely negative because men would simply close themselves in, 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 the, in that environment and would buy sexual robots and would never establish normal relationships with real women. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then there are also interesting arguments uh, on the other side. For example, there are people who say, and perhaps they are a bit conservative about that issue that there are men that can't really quite establish relationships with real w women for a reason or another and particularly psychological reasons uh, because they have lack of uh, an extreme lack of social skills or something like yeah. that and, and and then they would argue for sexual robots in the sense that the sexual robot would allow for those men to have access to a sexual object, let's say, and to avoid them committing other type of atrocities that they, right, be, right. That they could be predisposed to commit because they would have higher levels of testosterone without sexual activity, for example. Okay, okay. Well, I mean, to the degree that sexual coercion and, and rape may, you know, are, they're not just about power, but they are about sexual access. I, I, I can see that argument, I guess. I, um, you know, I haven't, I haven't thought a lot about this. Um, I, I would say that the argument that people will just lock themselves up in with their robot and never develop a, a relationship with people, um, doesn't really track the way humans overall are a social species. And just because you can have intercourse with a robot doesn't mean that you wouldn't. <laughs> I mean, my concern is that the males would be very attached to this robot and seek some intimacy, some emotional intimacy with that robot and then not be not not get it, depending upon how developed the robot is. Uh, we're, we're making progress with robots as, as far as I can tell. Um, but I, I think that that concern that males would no longer develop relationships with people seems, I, I, I would not argue, I would not agree with that. We are, we are just a social species and we, we thrive on relationships, both males and females. And we know that males engage in emotional, you know, they engage in emotional sharing. They do it less often with each other, but they do it more often with their female partners um, than, uh, than male partners. Um, yeah, I just think some, that's somebody making like the slippery slope argument and taking it all the way to the end, right? Um, technology is, is not going away. Uh, and so I think we have to, we have to tread carefully but think about the ways that we can use technology to really um, keep our negative energies in check and also fulfill our desires while not hurting others, right, in the process. Uh, and I, and yeah, that, that's, we got to, you know, lots of, lots of decisions. And I think, you know, like, like happens now, couples, couples have to make these decisions together. Um, about how they want to handle stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and now I would like to move to another topic, in this case, assortative mating. Okay. We, we, we've been talking a lot about bodily traits and what men and women like in the opposite <laughs> sex in terms of the physical appearance, right? Right. Um, but there are also other major psychological aspects that men right. and women attend to when choosing a mate. So, for example, uh, it is very common for people to prefer mates with similar personalities and similar religious and political attitudes, for example. Right. So, so from an evolutionary point of view, why is assortative mating in the sense that people tend to choose people that are closer to them 
in terms of psychology, let's say, why would that be advantageous from an evolutionary point of view? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think there are a couple of reasons for assortment, and I, th I think about it in the context not only of, a, of assortative mating, but also assortative friendship. Um, because by allying yourself with similar others, you know, in, in the context of tribalism, assortment is good um, in the sense that it, it helps people um, I mean, it can it can perpetuate tribalism and in group out group dynamics, but even just at the individual level of a relationship, attending to those who are similar to yourself it means that you are more likely to um, meet with strategic confluence. That you are both after the same goals. That you can work together. Um, you're less likely to come into conflict conflict with that person if they are. I mean, granted, you can compete towards similar goals, but you can also work together toward getting fulfilling a goal. Um, but you know, being at odds in terms of what you're, what you're after, or um, what you think about something can can lead to conflict, and and um, a lot of people don't really enjoy conflict, particularly in close relationships with with others, right? Um, <clears throat> so I think there's that element, and of course, then there's the the genetic similarity element. I think um, Phil Rushton and um, um, one of his co-authors, Bonds, I um, can't remember her first name, but they really made the case that people select both friends and romantic partners that are similar to oneself um, and, the, and the romantic partners, right? You have some, um, you're more likely to be uh, reproducing with somebody who has some smaller yet higher degree of genetic similarity to you than somebody nabbed at random off the street. Uh, and that is, in an evolutionary sense, useful from the genetic, you know, the gene's eye view. So I think there's there are both genetic elements at play and also strategic confluence and getting along uh, at play. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And now I would like to ask you about a particular study that you've done with the trolley problem mm. <laughs> and and how would people choose between killing five people or one and for the audience and people who don't know about this the trolley problem is basically there's a railway and there's a trolley coming down it and you have a lever next to you and then if you let the trolley come down by itself it will kill five people but you can push the lever and it will only kill one and save the other five and of course there's a lot of different versions of this and Joshua Green talks a lot about that for example but in in that particular study you use the trolley problem and you concluded that people would rather save the one person if she was young, genetically related to them, or a romantic partner. Could you talk a little bit about the particularities of that study and sure. how it was relevant to understand uh, human relationships? Sure, sure. Um, so, yeah, so in that study, we we manipulated... Okay, so again, the, the trolley problem. Uh, and, uh, Granted, this is one of the big issues with the trolley problem is that it is hypothetical. Uh, and I think people are now making scenarios using this where they're putting people in the virtual reality of the situation, which is super cool, or revising it to making it um, relevant to more modern days, you know, throwing yourself on a, on a bomb, uh, for example. Uh, but we, you have these five people who are who are about to die, and you can um, switch the lever and get the trolley going onto a different track. But on that track is this lone individual um, who would die in order to save those five. Do you act? And the utilitarian approach is to act, uh, save five over one. Um, if you are somebody who believes in fate and don't want to interfere with fate, then you might have the I'm not going there. Um, so. On average, in the generic scenario, people are more likely to choose to act um, and save five over one. And um, we were uh, manipulating that lone individual to um, increase people's willingness to, um, or should we say, well, mess with, decrease and increase, decrease and increase people's willingness to um, do away with that lone target in order to save the five. And so we manipulated the sex of the individual, male or female. We manipulated the age 
whether they were um, young or old. Uh, we had a, a two-year-old condition and an 18-year-old condition, 45-year-old um, condition, I believe. Uh, we also manipulated in another study their, um, whether they were a reproductive partner or a romantic partner or not. Um, we, uh, and then we manipulated their genetically, genetic relatedness. So you can have an old person who's 25% related, they're going to be a grandfather. Um, so in the end, right, people are more likely to sacrifice the lone individual if they are old. They are more likely to sacrifice or less likely to sacrifice the lone individual if they are young. Um, if they are genetically related, they are, um, and with increasing levels of genetic relatedness, people are less likely to sacrifice. And the romantic partner is the interesting one, right? Because here you have this person who can take care of themselves. They're not genetically related. Uh, and yet people are, are uh, less likely to sacrifice that individual. Uh, and, of, and of course, they're a reproductive vehicle, they're your reproductive partner, presumably, so you should be less willing to sacrifice them. And in fact, people are less willing to sacrifice um, them. Mm -hmm. So, and Do you think that we could obtain the same results instead of putting their romantic partner in the scene, uh, putting in, it, in its place a possible future mate, for example, someone from the opposite sex, who add all the good traits? Um, yeah, you know, it's an interesting question. And I think there has to be a personal connection there. So in my mind, this would be like a virtual reality setup. And this is somebody who is, um, who has been in a previous phase of the experiment that they have shown romantic interest in you. And now here they are on this trolley um, or on the tracks would you sacrifice them in order to save five other people? This is somebody who just signaled that they are romantically interested in you. Um, but I think there has to be that, that very real possibility. Uh, and not that we don't value lives differently. I, I mean, I was just listening to Sam Harris the other day saying, you know, we say that all lives are equal, but the fact of the matter is if there's a burning building, um, at least for most presidents, people would go after the president who's stuck in the building before anybody else, you know, that that person has a priority. Um, and I was like, oh, that's an interesting way of thinking about, you know, e equality. But I think when you, when you become involved with somebody, they become your romantic partner because they, and, and hence I say that it's important to have that, that, that interest shown like if you want that romantic if you want that potential mate to influence decision making in the trolley problem there has to be some indication that they truly are interested in you and i say i i think this because there's some research to suggest that when people are in a relationship or somebody wants them they are more likely to want them back the kind of thing of like oh i have them so um um they're they're attractive as opposed to they're attractive so i want them or I must keep them alive, um, that, that we become attached to the things that we have. Um, and of course, the things that we think want us, I think we also become attached to. Uh, this, this is relevant for all types of things, by the way. I mean, I, how many times do you, do you meet somebody in a relationship and you ask, you know, what did you, what did you, what do you love about this person? What made you fall in love with this person? Um, or was it just the fact that they loved you? Is that what you loved about that? <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? There's yeah. this, we have this weird idea of what are the causes of our behaviors. And I don't think they always match up with the actual causes of our behaviors. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, how do you think evolutionary psychology could help people deal better with their interpersonal relationships? Because, uh, I mean, I, I would say that uh, if you are to have consciously available to you the information about the subconscious motivations that lead you to have a certain behavior toward another person, and in this case, uh, in terms of friendships, for example, uh, that, we, uh, that you start having a rivalry with a friend just because <laughs> of this subconscious right, stuff right. we've been talking about here, wouldn't you say that if that were to be the case that people knew about this information that if they were to start 
uh, behaving badly toward a friend that they would at least think twice before yeah. before making something about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm one of those people who likes to think that awareness of our underlying motives and factors that could be driving our behavior are, are important to understand because we have so much research in psychology in general that our perceptions of the causes of our behavior are often way off. And and that's not to say that the evolutionary perspective is is the only perspective to inform us of our of our motives, but you know, I, I, I feel like I have been able to use it to my benefit, right? Understanding that we're a social species and that we, we thrive on connection even when connection can be hard. Sometimes it's easier to exclude yourself. Um, but recognizing that element of, of, the hu of human nature uh, means that you put yourself out there and you take a chance um, on building connection with somebody and it can be really reinforcing. It's almost like exercise, right? Like, I don't feel like going to exercise, but we know how we know it's good for us and um, social interaction and um, building confidence with somebody is also useful. I think that with my good friends, recognizing um, the limits of friendship slots and time to invest in close relationships um, has made me a more conscious friend and it's also made me more honest with um, the friends I do have. So if I recognize that they're, that I might be friends with people because of the uniquely desirable qualities that they offer me that other people don't, why wouldn't I go ahead and tell them that? Like, wow, it's so cool that you are like this. I really like that about you. And I don't see that in any of my other friends. Um, to say that is is kind of weird, right? <laughs> like, I think a lot of people don't say stuff like that to their friends. Um, but I do. And I do it because I know about evolutionary um, underpinnings of the way that we have limited niches for our friends, um, that we experience rivalry between uh, with our friends and we expect not to, you know, they're friends. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be in competition with them. Um, and just being able to say, wow, I really, I really envy how good you are at, you know, being a mother, or I really envy how, how beautiful you look in your swimsuits. Um, but being able to say that you envy it and you admire it and you don't hold it against somebody. Like if you just recognize it in yourself and accept it and then be like, yeah, I feel this now I'm going to go ahead and let them know because I feel it because man, they're, they're great. And so, and like we talked about with opposite sex friendship, I think open communication can be, can be very useful as, as well, because you don't want people to be wasting their time either. If they're in a relationship and somebody is misleading them, you're wasting their time uh, or they're wasting your time. That, that doesn't seem useful. Uh, so, I think I think evolutionary awareness is really important. I think about this in the context of you know when I when in evolutionary psychology when I talk about um, waist to hip ratio, and I think a lot of people's minds just kind of open up like oh my gosh like men are looking at my my waist to hip ratio and they and they want to measure themselves and 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 I say you know it's not like it's not like men are saying oh look at her look at her small waist she, and her wide hips she can she can have a lot of children. You know, nobody's counting babies here. N nobody's consciously doing calculations about their reproductive success. What has evolved is the tendency to view that small waist as highly attractive. And so now they can articulate what it is that people are attending to. And, and ideally they can articulate why, but the, the life is just as beautiful. The waist, the, the body is just as attractive as it ever was. Um, I think about the context of, of maternal investment and paternal investment for that matter. Uh, we, we invest tremendously in our offspring and some people might think an, an evolutionary analysis of why is so twisted. Like you're only investing in your offspring because you want, you know, ideally your genes would get in the next generation. And from a genes eye view, we should be engaging in behaviors that, you know, get our genes into the next generation. Understanding that does not make me love my kids any less. I, I enjoy every moment I have with them and I uh, understanding why I love high fat, high calorie foods, unfortunately doesn't make me love them any less, right? But it's nice to have an understanding of, of why that craving can be so strong, um, why that bias toward my offspring compared to others can be so strong and understanding it 
doesn't make me love them less, but it also can help me harness my bias, right? When I recognize that, yes, this is an evolved bias of, of favoring people and individuals who are likely to share genes with me and attitudes that I have and, and so on. So I view it as all good in terms of, at least if we have the right values in place, knowledge is power and power for the good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And don't you think that evolutionary psychology, if it is not yet, it should be the core theory of psychology? Because, yeah. Because, because I mean, uh, in human psychology, all stems from evolution, even cognitive psychology, personality psychology, cultural psychology, behavior genetics, and all of those things, right? Yeah, I think one of you know, it was one of those, and I had many of these moments with David Buss, um, but I remember him him talking one day, or I don't remember what the context was, but talking about how, and he does this in his, in his evolutionary psychology textbook, which has been a, a gift to the field, and it, granted there are multiple textbooks to choose from now, but doing that first and bringing that to the discipline was just tremendous, because he is carving nature at its joints, and that's the way he talks about it, that thinking about evolution helps us understand humans and carving it out in a way that makes sense. Uh, yeah, I, th I think about even, you know, the the Association for Psychological Science, They you have all these poster sessions and every poster is put, put into a category and there's this like short list of categories, where does yours fit in? Um, it could fit into all of them, depending on what it is. It could be personality and developmental, and it could be about memory, and it could be about sex differences. Where does it fit? Uh, and I think an evolutionary paradigm provides more, more realistic structure to what humans are all about, for sure. It's alarming to me that we have textbooks that really never mention family. Really? <laughs> like, how could we have a psychology textbook that doesn't talk about family? Uh, they talk a lot about gender, maybe, but actually yeah. family and kin, extended family, food sharing. That it, like that's just such a huge part of being human. Uh, and and yeah, we have numerous psychology textbooks that would never just go there at all. Mm -hmm. And would you say that as a psychology as we have it today could be considered a branch of biology, particularly because of the evolutionary psychology side of things? Um, can you can you ask that one more time? Uh, if you think that psychology as we have it today could be considered a branch of biology, particularly because of the evolutionary psychology sure, sure. side of things. Sure. Well, I mean, psychology is the study of living things, or biology is the study of life, right, and living things. And so I, and, and we as biological organisms, in a way, are. Um, so my guess is that psych most psychologists, or at least evolutionary psychologists, would agree that we are, in many ways, biologists studying people. Um, and, and we most, uh, I think, of us find it kind of alarming that your typical student in psychology never has to take uh, a course in evolution. Uh, and, um, of course, SUNY Binghamton, I believe, has made some progress on, on in that regard. So, among other schools, I guess. I, I my, my thought, based on my experience, and granted this is just my personal experience, is that it's the biologists who we would have to convince. Because so many biologists, um, when they think of evolutionary psychology, they think still think of Stephen Jay Gould um, or other people like that who have kind of done evolutionary psychology no favors and have perpetuated misunderstandings about what it means to be studying adaptation, um, how, how evolution by selection could operate on humans like any other species, they just, they have perpetuated misunderstandings and confusions. And so many of the people who I talk with in biology uh, are, are 
hopelessly confused. Uh, they think yeah, I'm, and, they and think I'm over here counting babies. Yeah, and now you're particularly, uh, particularly talking about uh, how people like Jay Gould and Lee Wontin reacted to sociobiology yes. in the 70s, 80s yeah. and so on, right? Yeah, and they really don't realize that the field is so much um, different and so so far advanced um, beyond that. And and frankly, they didn't do a whole lot of service to behavioral genetics either. Uh, they misrepresented many of those findings. And so, yeah, it's 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 frustrating. So I don't know what other people would say. My guess is that, that and maybe not all psychologists feel this way, but evolutionary psychologists. I can't think of one who wouldn't be like, yes, we are biological organisms. We should be at least in the sciences. Um, biologists are, they, they're, you know, there are many subdisciplines within psychology and um, their exposure, even if they are evolutionary biologists, I think varies quite widely and they vary widely in their understanding of what our discipline is all about. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so just perhaps a last question, because yeah. I know that two of the, your favorite psychological disciplines are evolutionary psychology and behavior genetics, mm -hmm. and they are also my two favorite disciplines. So uh, uh, I'm very interested in this question. That is, what is the relationship of what would you say is the relationship between evolutionary psychology and behavior genetics? And, and how would you say each of them informs the other? Okay. Um, well, maybe I can speak to it best by talking about how maybe they inform me. Um, I, I love these two disciplines probably for the same reasons that you do. You know, they're, they're flip sides of the same coin. We have one that's really speaking to our, our universals, and we have another that really focuses on individual differences. Uh, we also have the intersection of the two where you look at group differences. So the which I, which I think is, a, is an intersection of the two, for real. You have individual and group differences, and then you have universals, and you have kind of group universals, group patterns. Uh, and so the two do overlap some, somewhat, right? And of course, you need heritable individual differences in order to get evolution to operate. So they, they do rely on each other. Um, heritable variation is, is the crux, right? Or the, one of the engines of, of selection. So I think they're important in that way. But behavioral, and maybe this is because I started in behavioral genetics, but a behavioral genetics mindset runs through everything I do. Because once you start thinking probabilist, probabilistically, and you start trying to disentangle genes from genetic influences from environmental influences, immediately you start being suspicious of causal claims because genes and environment being confounded is your classic example of confounding variables, which is relevant for research design in general. And so that, that whole way of thinking, I know, you know, Matt McHugh, he defines behavioral genetics as, you know, the study of genetic and environmental influences. And you can do this at the, you know, the larger level of through twin and adoption studies. And you can also look at it at the micro level through, you know, specific genetically informed studies with SNPs and so on. Um, um, essentially molecular genetic studies. But I think the behavior genetics, uh, behavior genetics is a way of thinking about the world that, that really breaks it down into multiple causes of, of individual differences. And then evolutionary psychology, same thing. It's looking at multiple causes evolutionary history and environmental socialization and it's looking at it over the over a long haul not just an individual lifespan but over the long haul so they really go together so well uh, and and I and I feel like I rely on both of them and it's kind of interesting to me when I meet somebody who's an evolutionary psychologist and really doesn't know anything about behavioral genetics and then I think how, how can that be how can you not how can you not have that other side because it seems so crucial? Uh, and likewise, when you have somebody who's a behavioral geneticist and they don't know anything about evolutionary psychology except what they heard from a, from a commentary uh, about a book by Stephen Jay Gould, and I think, how could that be? How could you not, how could you be in behavioral genetics thinking about heritable individual differences and not 
have evolutionary psychology. So to me, it's more even just the conceptual understanding that the two provide that's beyond important. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just before we finish, would you like perhaps to share with people where they can follow your work on the internet? And I don't know if you're also active on social media or not. Sure, sure. Uh, no, I'm not really active on social media. I think I have a Facebook account, but I haven't been there in a while. <laughs> I do have, um, I am very active at the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire, and uh, so I'm easy to find there. But I have a, a website, uh, www.bleskirecheck.com. So really easy to get a hold of um, or to find me and my and um, samples of my work and, and so on. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. Blesky Ricek, it was really a pleasure to talk to you today. I think it was really a pleasant conversation and a very interesting one. And I will be getting back to you in the future for us to have uh, other conversations because these can't end here. Good, <laughs> so, that'd be great. Okay, okay, and thank you a lot for taking the time to be on the show today. Oh, oh and please don't end the call. I will end the recording now, but please don't end the call because Sounds I will. Good. I will. I will like to have just a quick word with you. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay. Hi everybody, thank you for coming to my channel and for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel last February and have, be, have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. To keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge. Any amount, even one dollar, would already be a great help. Otherwise, if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke and Nan Blanchett. Thank you for all.